Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah. Um, so as, as he said, um, I want to discuss a little bit uh, uh, current and, and future trends in, in supercomputing. And uh, so one overarching trend from our perspective, so our perspective means the deep and deeper project and uh, UD Supercomputing Center in, in more general is that uh, supercomputing will uh, become kind of modular. And uh, so what this means hopefully will get clear by the end of the talk. Um, so, but first of all, uh, let, let's start with, um, with, with a brief outline of, of the talk. So um, I, I will start, uh, as it hopefully makes sense, with some motivation. And uh, for that, I, I will discuss a little bit supercomputing architectures in general. And then I will come to the point uh, that uh, yeah, heterogeneous systems um, will become beneficial in the future. And then, of course, the question is how to organize this heterogeneity. Um, and uh, so I, I will start with discussing uh, how heterogeneity looks today and how we think it uh, might be, uh, might look in the future and, and try to give during the talk some arguments why, why this is the case. Um, that the main talk, uh, part of the talk will be about DEEP, uh, so the DEEP project, which ended uh, in September last year, uh, which for the first time introduced this, this new approach of, he of heterogeneity. And um, yeah, we'll start with the general concept, then discuss briefly the hardware architecture, and then we'll concentrate on the programming paradigm because this is what the end user has to uh, face uh, uh, if, if he wants to use uh, uh, some kind of system. Then I have a, a, short, a short section on deeper, so the, the current project, which extends the, the deep architecture. And then finally, uh, I have one or two slides on, on how to, to bring this further into the future and, and how to, to get into this modular supercomputing. Okay, so first of all, of course, this is not uh, work of, of my own and, and not even work of just Uli Supercomputing Center, but this is the work of two big European projects with many, many partners. So uh, this slide just uh, lists the, the, uh, the, the partners involved. And as I said, so two big European projects, so the D project already uh, has ended uh, in last September and um, so the, and uh, was an uh, yeah, effort of almost four years with a uh, significant budget um, with uh, yeah, in total 16 partners out of uh, eight European countries. Uh, and uh, so a kind of follow up project uh, with a significant overlap of about one year uh, is a deep ER project or deeper project. Um, with also 14 partners out of seven countries. Um, so both of these projects, uh, or so the, the, the acronym uh, DEEP stands for a Dynamical Exascale Entry Platform, so really uh, a, a big goal in this name. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I will come during my talk on uh, what, what this dynamic uh, actually is uh, within the, uh, in this acronym. And uh, so the deep ER then is bes besides the um, uh, play with the words uh, is uh, the deep extended range project. Okay, so but before actually talking about how uh, supercomputing might evolve in the future, I guess it makes sense to have a brief look into the, the history of supercomputing. And, uh, and, and to discuss a little bit how supercomputing architectures uh, evolved. And so this slide tries to summarize uh, the evolution of, uh, well, now almost 80 years of uh, supercomputing. And you, you might raise the question, well, so the first computers, were these really supercomputers? Well, it depends. Um, of course, it were the only computer, so that there was no big di differentiator. But nevertheless, um, uh, so, they, so, so if, if you look at, at current definitions of supercomputing, they basically were supercomputers. So they were highly specialized machines, very expensive, very complicated. Um, of course, these were the first experiments, but nevertheless, uh, um, also the application fields uh, were 
what we claim today uh, will be handed, uh, handled by supercomputers. Um, so, which means that this, this early exploratory phase of computing basically was dominated by supercomputers. Then, of course, um, computers became more and more a commodity. Well, so the, the commodity in the 60s also was quite limited, but at least it were not only research labs which could uh, effort uh, to uh, own and run a, a computer, but there were always also big companies uh, which were able to, uh, to use these type of systems. Uh, but nevertheless, it turned out that the, the, the di direction uh, sp kind of split it up. So on the one hand side, there, there were these uh, big insurance companies and banks uh, using their computers in, in order to do their enterprise computing. On the other hand, uh, th th there was still the requirement to do some more scientific and engineering oriented um, uh, simulation. And for that, uh, it, it quite early turned out that it might make sense to have uh, dedicated architectures for that. And so in the, in the uh, 60s, in the basically in the late 60s and early 70s, so the first real supercomputers popped up. So the first were machines like the cyber mas machines from control data and then later on the, the Cray machines. Um, so that the Cray one appeared sometimes in the, uh, uh, around 75. Um, so, and, and the main differentiator to these enterprise computers were that the, the focus was really on floating point. Um, and then later on, they, they used very specialized technologies, so vector processors, and, and uh, yeah, partly also um, they, they moved away from the silicon technology and uh, yeah, used some, some special transistors which uh, promised uh, to, to be uh, faster and so on and, and so on. Nevertheless, the problem was that the, the number of machines that were built uh, obviously was, was quite low. Uh, which means that the, um, uh, that, that, that the, the uh, engineering costs that have to be paid only once in order to develop the system had to be divided onto, relatively, onto a relatively no, low number of systems, uh, which in the end means that uh, the more expensive the engineering gets, uh, the more expensive uh, each and every machine uh, got. And so, uh, then sometimes in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, it turned out that it was more beneficial to really integrate just standard processes instead of developing uh, your own processor, uh, using your own processing techno uh, processor building technology, so your, your own silicon technology and so on. And, um, and uh, so then, uh, uh, yeah, these, these MPP and, uh, and later on cluster type uh, of systems appeared, uh, which basically used just the standard processors. So today, these are Intel processors. In these days, these were workstation processors like the Spark processors from Sun, uh, which were used in the connection machines, or Alpha processors from Digital Equipment Company at that time, uh, th which were used, for example, in the, in the early Cray MPP system. Um, and basically, we are f yeah, kind of um, at the end of, of this phase, and now what uh, for uh, yeah, about five years comes up are so-called heterogeneous cluster systems. Um, and I, I will uh, discuss this heterogeneity later on in a little bit more detail. Um, so in, in order to, to, to look at this development, it's uh, quite useful to have a, take a look at the top 500 list. Uh, so even though you, you might discuss if the top 500 list is uh, really very meaningful uh, con con concerning yeah, what, what is the biggest computer and, and how to de define the, the biggest and fastest computer. Nevertheless, uh, so the fact that it, uh, uh, that it looks at 500 system uh, is quite useful in order to identify trends. And uh, so uh, what this slide shows is the, the trend of, of architectures uh, of systems in the top 500 list. And what you see is, while well, in the early days, uh, so top 500 started in, in, in uh, June 93, uh, that, that there was a, a, a big variance of, of systems. So uh, it, it, it started with, with early MPP systems, uh, 
uh, that there were still SMP and, and uh, even uh, single processor systems. So of course these were uh, quite uh, big and, and uh, complex um, uh, processors. So basically these were um, uh, vector processors so either from Cray or from one of the Japanese companies. Um, and, and even these uh, uh, SIMD type systems, so uh, um, yeah, SIMD in, in a similar sense as, as we have today in the vector units of the standard processors, but uh, at a much larger scale. So, uh, so you, you had a kind of distributed SIMD system. So with a central unit um, decoding the inst instruction and, and then telling all the execution units which were distributed over the whole system to now, uh, to as a next step, execute really this instruction. And um, so after some, uh, some, some change, so now we have the situation that we have basically only two um, architectures in the top 500 list. So on the one hand side, cluster systems, and on the other hand, MPP system. Nevertheless, all these systems basically just use standard processors, right? Uh, so most of the MPP systems, so that there are some blue gene systems, but most of the MPP systems there are actually Cray systems using also AMD or Intel processors. Um, so we, we, we have a quite homogeneous uh, list uh, today. Nevertheless, we, we have this differentiation between cluster and MPP system. And the difference is that on an MPP system, that the idea behind an MPP system, that it's more scalable. And this is also reflected in the type of systems uh, that we run, for example, in Jülich. So in, in, in fact, in Jülich, we, we have these two lines of systems. On the one hand side, these highly scalable systems, so um, basically uh, blue gene systems, uh, which are used for the highly scalable uh, applications. On the other hand, uh, cluster systems, uh, so we, we started uh, with, with power-based clusters, but then in 2009 switched over to um, Intel-based clusters, so at that time when we brought Jeropa into production, and then uh, last year we finally brought Jeroka into production, which are uh, both Intel-based uh, uh, clusters. So what, what is the, the idea behind these two lines of systems that we run? Uh, well, it's, it's basically um, motivated by application scalability. Um, so if you look at these blue gene systems, you will find out that only uh, very few applications are really able to scale to the, the whole machine. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, if, if you look into the codes, you, you find out, well, basically uh, these are kind of sparse matrix vector codes or codes which are similar to, to this type of operation. Uh, with quite regular communication patterns. So really the, the application that are well suited for the blue gene queue. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have a plethora of other applications uh, which cannot really benefit from blue gene for, for, for various reasons. Uh, so they, they might have a less regular uh, control flow or, or less regular memory accesses uh, where the um, uh, blue gene processor does not uh, work uh, too well. They might have complicated uh, communication patterns where you want to have a more or less flat network, so at least a, a, a fat tree network instead of some type of torus network. Um, and um, well, in, in fact, it turns out that these applications are kind of less capable to, to actually exploit uh, accelerators as well, uh, but we'll come to, to accelerators later on. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, so, so if you look into the applications, um, you, you find out that there are a few of them that, that run on this side of our systems, uh, which might at least partly be able to, to benefit from a highly scalable system too. Um, nevertheless, so it's, it's hard to, to uh, so, so it, it's really hard to, to split a, uh, a, a problem to solve uh, onto two systems because you have to do co-scheduling and, and all this type of stuff. Uh, nevertheless, so uh, that, that was one of our motivations to really uh, see how we, we, we can help these type of applications uh, to, um, to benefit from, from a kind of heterogeneity. Um, so the other part uh, concerning heterogeneity is um, uh, to discuss uh, uh, where, where does it uh, come from from a technical 
blunted techno technology point of view. Um, for this, I, I, uh, I brought uh, this plot, uh, which on the one hand side shows the, the evolution of, of single processor um, speed and the evolution of, of system speed um, in, in one plot. And, and what you see here are, are two uh, or, or, or kind of three basic trends. So the first trend is that you see that the uh, single processor performance uh, increases with a rate of about a uh, factor 100 per 10 years. So basically what you see here is Moore's law and I will come to Moore's law on the next slide. On the other hand, you see that the, uh, the, the supercomputer systems uh, see a factor of 1000 per decade. Um, this is uh, uh, basically what, what you see here is, is the top one system of the top 500 list. Um, and of course, I have to admit, so uh, all, all the, the points starting ab about here are just projections, right? So these are future projects which hopefully will create these points. And uh, last but not least, what you of course also see is if you look at single processor performance <coughs> is uh, that this uh, yeah, Moore's law trend of a factor 100 per decade kinds of levels off, right? So this is more kind of Ten, factor of 10 per decade. Uh, and, and so the question is, uh, can we really, it, it, uh, so, so one question is how were we able to achieve this factor 1000 per decade over the factor 100 per decade, which just comes for free from Moore's law. And on the other hand, um, uh, yeah, can, can we actually uh, sustain uh, this factor if we see that Moore's law kinds of levels off? Um, so two, two important questions. Um, so uh, con concerning Moore's law, um, I have this plot uh, which shows um, yeah, that, that Moore's law itself is uh, quite well alive. And uh, so let, let's raise the question, what's, what does Moore's law actually say? Well, Gordon Moore, so one of the uh, founders of Intel, uh, found out in the late uh, 60s that looking at integrated circuits, um, uh, engineers were able to, to about double the number of transistors to, to be put into an integrated circuit uh, uh, every uh, about 18 to 24 months. So at, at that time, it, it was more like, like every 24 months. Uh, so sometimes in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, this was accelerated a little bit and, and became a, a factor of two uh, about every 18 months. And then coming from these doubling and shrinking of transistors, uh, that there were some side effects, right? So one side effect, of course, is, well, you have more transistors, so you, you can realize more complex um, uh, circuits, uh, which means that you can make your processor more complex uh, so, so being able, for example, to, to, to be out of order, so, so to be able to, to do restruction, uh, instruction reordering, <laughs> um, to um, increase the number of pipelines that you have to uh, make the pipelines longer, and, and, and all these are factors which uh, speed up the actual computation uh, carried out on, on this system. Um, on the other hand, if you shrink the transistor, you can increase the clock cycle. <laughs> So this is what you see, for example, here. Uh, so the frequency was increasing until uh, yeah, the, the middle of the first decade of the uh, 2000 years. Um, yeah, so the, the increased complexity you can read at, at the single thread performance. On the other hand, there is a side effect, and this is that also the, the, the typical power consumed uh, by the microprocessor uh, increases. Right, and uh, yeah, you have to keep in mind these are r this is a logarithmic scale, so which means that yeah, each step just gives you a factor of ten in power. Um, so uh, and and then uh, yeah, uh, about two thousand five, that there was a kind of magic wall hit, uh, and this is that the the typical power of a processor is really hard to handle if this uh, gets significantly above one hundred watts. So 100 watts is an, uh, is, is, is an amount of power that you can more or less easily cool 
from a, uh, from, from a single chip. Uh, if you go significantly uh, uh, beyond that, uh, well, you, you really have to fight with, with technology and, and especially uh, if, if you look at these commodity devices like, uh, like, like standard servers or, or workstations, so it's really hard to just cool these devices with just air. Uh, so which means that you have to introduce water cooling for, for single workstation and servers, which nobody really wants to do. And, and so, um, yeah, we, we, we hit this uh, 100 watt wall for power consumption, which then uh, led to the fact that, the, that also the, the frequency levels off. So basically the power consumption is driven by the frequency you, uh, which you use in order to run the processor. So what was the way out? Well, the way out was that, that at, at the same point of time, the number of logical cores was increased. Um, so th this is a simple back of the envelope uh, computation that, uh, yeah, in instead of just uh, in in increasing the, uh, the, the power consumption by increasing the frequency, it makes more sense to increase the power consumption by having more cores. Um, of course, uh, this uh, introduced an important change in, in the way uh, user had to handle these processors. So basically, until this time here, um, it was um, quite easy to, to benefit from the processor. So basically, you just had to recompile your program, if at all. And so you just bought the next generation of processors, and, the, uh, and, and your application was running faster. So and this stopped at la latest at that point of time, where you had multiple cores, so now you had to, to have an application which was able to benefit from the multiple cores. That was no real problem at that point of type in supercomputing because everybody was programming in MPI anyhow, so uh, yeah, we, we, we were able to, to benefit from multiple processes within a single node of our cluster or MPP. Nevertheless, so if, if you look at desktop computing, that was a real game changer at that time. Um, if you look at current trends, so what you see is that, well, um, all, all the processors are multi-core or many-core, and all the processors basically use simultaneous multi-threading uh, in, in order to benefit on one hand side from, from, from the, 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 the cores that you have, and to even um, yeah, double or quadruple the, uh, the, the way uh, the, the single core can compute. Um, Okay, so this is a good point of time to introduce the difference between general purpose processors, so the, the Intel or AMD processors that you have in your, your laptops or in your workstations uh, at home. Um, uh, so uh, what are the, stand, the, the main characteristics of these processors? Uh, well, basically, they, they really have a broad range of capabilities, and uh, today they are always multi-core, so there, there are... Um, uh, processors with up to 20 cores, and uh, especially they show quite high single thread performance. So they run at a uh, pretty high frequency. They they know how to do this out of order processing. So how to reorder the instructions in order to uh, hide the time that you need in order to wait for data for main memory because main memory is quite s slow. Um, you have quite large memory per core, um, so you don't have to think about too, uh, think too much about how to, to reduce the, the amount of memory uh, to use uh, for your application. And you have these standard programming environments like uh, MPI, OpenMP, and so on. Of course, uh, they have some shortcomings, so the, the energy efficiency is, is a bit limited, and uh, also they, they are if, if you just look at them at, a, uh, f uh, at, at the per flop costs, they are um, quite expensive. Um, on the other hand, there are so-called accelerators, and uh, so today we, we basically see two types of them. On the one hand side, um, there are these uh, Intel Xeon Phi processors, um, so which Intel calls a many-core processor which have a, signif a significantly higher number of cores, uh, so uh, 60 uh, in, in the, the still current generation of uh, Xeon Phi and uh, up to 72 in the next generation of, of Xeon Phi. Uh, they have um, uh, 
yeah, four threads per core, so uh, a, a quadruple SMT uh, approach uh, compared to the uh, uh, dual SMT approach that you see in, in standard Xeon processors. Um, on the other hand, the, the single thread performance is quite limited. Um, uh, on the one hand side, due to the fact that it's an in-order architecture, so this is true for the current generation. The next generation will also support out-of-order operations and has a relatively low frequency. So while the, the standard Xeon processors go up to 3 gigahertz, so uh, the uh, Xeon 5 processors run at about 1 gigahertz. Nevertheless, they are uh, energy efficient, uh, so way more energy efficient than the Xeon processors, as long as your application can, can benefit from the features the processor shows. Um, and they are a, a, a bit cheaper, so compared on the flop uh, rate uh, compared to the standard Xeon processors. Still, you have the standard programming models, so MPI and, and, and OpenMP on this, these uh, processors available. Um, and uh, which is one important point, uh, especially for our project, is that they might run autonomously, so which means without a host processor. Um, so this comes out of the box for the next generation of Xeon Phi, so for the current generation, we, we had to do some tricks, but nevertheless, it's, it's possible to run them uh, really standalone. On the other hand, you have this GPGPU, um, uh, many core processors, um, or graphic cards. So they, they come out of this field of, of, of graphics processing, actually. And then about 10 years ago, first people found out that the, at that time, current um, graphical processing units were actually be able to run uh, some specialized uh, floating point operations. So at that time, basically single precision floating point operations, but they were able to, to run them very efficiently, at, at least for the application that these people had. And uh, so out of this uh, evolved a, a, a real business. So in the meantime, NVIDIA actually develops uh, um, yeah, graphical processing units, which are basically just uh, yeah, kind of specialized um, uh, many core processors or, or, or ZIMD machines on a ship, so something like that. Um, so the idea here is, uh, so this is put to more extreme than the Xeon Phi, to have hundreds of quite weak computing cores and put them all onto a single chip and, and uh, enable them to work uh, together in, an, in a quite efficient way, uh, which then uh, yeah, leads to a very uh, high, high energy efficiency and, uh, and, and reduces the, the number of dollars uh, per flop uh, even more. On the other hand, uh, well, at least today, you still have these uh, specialized programming models, so in order to get performance out of that, this, so, so CUDA, OpenCL. Um, of course, this, this changes in the meantime. So uh, also um, uh, NVIDIA and AMD, or, so the, the former ATI part, so they, they figured out that in order to, uh, to, 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 to really bring this into a broader market, uh, you uh, have to enable application developers uh, to, to, to keep their uh, code kind of portable. So to, to be able to run the same code, uh, more or less the same code, uh, on, uh, on both an, uh, a standard processor or on, on an accelerator. Uh, because otherwise you, you, you will run immediately into, into bigger trouble um, concerning um, uh, yeah, ma maintenance of code uh, and uh, yeah, you, you, you suddenly would have to support multiple of, uh, of, of branches of your, uh, your code, and this is especially in the commercial field uh, almost impossible to, to sustain. Um, on the other hand, so uh, at least until today, these uh, GPGPUs still require a, a host CPU. Um, so does this development already reflect in the top 500 architecture. Well, so if you look at this picture, this is not really visible, but there is, there is other data in the top 500 list uh, where, where you can read how many systems are there with accelerators. 
Uh, so this is not split up uh, uh, between the uh, cluster and, and MPP systems, and on, obviously on both sides there are these types of systems. So uh, there are Cray machines with accelerators, uh, and there are cluster systems with accelerators, so, uh, but, but we, we cannot really differentiate from the data we get out of the list. Um, so nevertheless, what you see that in the meantime, there are about uh, 100 systems which use one or the other accelerator. Uh, so, and this started uh, yeah, about five years ago. Uh, well, actually, it, it, it was already here. So, so th this is when Roadrunner came up using this cell processor at, at that point of time. Um, so in, in less than a decade, uh, already 20% uh, uh, of the list uses some kind of accelerators. So which means that, uh, yeah, it makes sense to start thinking about heterogeneity and how to organize heterogeneity. So first of all, let's have a look how a heterogeneous cluster or MPP looks today. Well, basically, uh, you have a standard cluster, so with some compute or cluster nodes attached to a fabric. Uh, so I, I use InfiniBand here, but of course for Cray systems, so these are their uh, propri proprietary interconnects. Uh, nevertheless, in the, in the standard market, Inf InfiniBand is, is quite dominant. Um, so which means you, you have these cluster nodes and uh, some fabric with a more or less flat topology uh, in between, uh, which allows you for really simple management of resources. And then you attach to, to each uh, of the cluster nodes, uh, one or more um, accelerators. So in, in this case, uh, GPU. Um, which means that you have a, stand, a static assignment between the CPUs and the GPUs. So if you have an application which is not capable to benefit from the GPU, well, you, you have a resource there in the node which is basically unused. On the other hand, if you have an application which can benefit from multiple GPUs, so due to the fact that you have just one GPU, uh, this means that maybe uh, part of the resources on the cluster nodes is there with, uh, sitting there without doing anything. Um, so the, the problem, of course, here is that uh, you, you have to decide this ratio between CPU and GPU at the time of procurement of the system. And, and, and after that, you, you're really not, not too flexible. Um, it would really help if these accelerators here, so the GPUs, um, would be able to, to act autonomously because if they can do that, um, you, you can think, oops, you can think about a system like that. Um, so if you go for more capable accelerators, which really can uh, act autonomously, uh, you can just directly access, uh, uh, attach them to the fabric. And now you, you can think about having a heterogeneous system where you have the, the accelerators or many core processors, however you want to call them, and the, the cluster nodes in the same fabric. And then suddenly the, uh, the, 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 the ratio between um, GPUs and uh, uh, between CPUs and accelerators is pretty flexible because you just use the, the fabric in order to do the assignment, right? And if you have an application which uh, can make use out of uh, two accelerators per node, well, you, uh, per, 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 per CPU node, well, you use uh, a, a CPU node and assign two accelerators node, accelerator nodes to it. Um, does this uh, introduce any problem? So bandwidth-wise? Well, not really, because the, the fabric today basically is in its speed limited by the speed that you have on the PCIe bus uh, that comes out of the CPU and goes into the accelerator. Of course, you introduce some extra latency, but from a bandwidth point of view, so that this is no major problem. Um, and uh, you can even think about uh, a different model. So if these accelerators are capable to run autonomously, well, you can think about putting just your application, uh, your application just on accelerators. Because you, you have a kind of uh, yeah, uh, do-it-yourself blue, blue gene system on this side with um, 
yeah, these, these many core, uh, highly capable many core processes attached directly to, to a fabric. Um, and um, well, later on we will see that uh, if, if you think about offloading, uh, so, so offloading today in a heterogeneous system where you just have an, uh, a CPU and, and a single or, or say two GPUs means that you can just do an offloading locally. So, and, and the offloaded parts uh, have a really hard time to talk to each other if they are distributed among multiple nodes. As soon as accelerators are autonomous, so uh, you, you can think about putting an, an MPI application on the, the accelerators and, and let it run there on its own. Um, so keep having this idea in mind, uh, so we started uh, it within the deep project uh, to think about the deep hardware architecture, and this is what came out. Um, so it, it looks similar to the picture before, but it, it has some differences, and these differences are due to the fact that the uh, first generation of Intel C and Phi uh, yeah, was not really able to run autonomously, uh, so we used some tricks. Uh, so we, we make them run almost autonomous. So what you see here is that there is a Xeon processors uh, in the cluster, um, and, and then we, we use InfiniBand. And then in order to, to make the KNC, so the first generation of Intel C on 5 processors, run autonomously, uh, we had to use a, a, a specialized fabric, so we used Xtol there. I have a slide later on about Xtol. And then, uh, which provides a 3D torus uh, topology network, and then put into this torus all these Intel C on 5 processors. Of course, you have to bridge between the two fabrics. For this, we have the so-called booster interface. And by the way, we, we call this cluster of Xeon Phi accelerators a booster, just to have a different name uh, instead of the cluster. And, and so this introduces a cluster booster concept. So a cluster of standard processors and a cluster of, of Xeon uh, Phi processors, a cluster of accelerators. And in order to, to couple these two clusters, you, you need an interface in between, which basically bridges between the, the InfiniBand and the x fabric, and at the same time, which, uh, yeah, actually these, these uh, Intel Xeon uh, cores here in this so-called booster interface nodes um, act as a, as a host, but now for, for many, many uh, Xeon Phi processors, so actually each of these Xeon processors is a host for 16 Xeon Phi processors. And uh, on, on the other hand, it, it just gets active during the boot phase of the Xeon Phi, so when the Xeon Phi is up and running, it really can act autonomously. So this, this is the basic hardware architecture that we implemented within the D project. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, 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 the implementation uh, looked like that. Um, so on the one hand side, we have this, uh, this cluster system. On the other hand, we had to develop some hardware uh, for the booster side. So on the one hand side, the, boost, the actual booster nodes, what you see here are the Xeon Phi cards. So from, from the, the physical integration, we, we, uh, we, we, we uh, integrate two of the logical booster node into one so-called booster node card. And what you see here is a booster node card with two Xeon uh, Phi processors on, on their own board, and, and then the, the actual booster node card, which has two network interfaces, which then plugs into, the, into a backplane. Um, in fact, uh, so this is just from the physical integration. Uh, so the, the, this, if this Xeon Phi here wants to call, uh, talk to this Xeon Phi, it has to go over the backplane so that there, there's no real shortcut. And uh, from the application point of view, there is no difference between talking from this Xeon Phi to that Xeon Phi or to any other Xeon Phi in the 3D torus. Right? So, so this, this is not really a, a, a two Xeon Phi system with, with some shared memory, so, so no Xeon Phi SMP system or something like that. On the other hand, of course, we had to develop these booster interface nodes here. So this is how this car looks like. And then this was integrated into, in, into a, a, a single system. Uh, with, in the end, uh, 384 uh, Xeon Phi processors um, integrated in, in, in this single rack. So what, what you can see here, so each of these slots uh, represent one of these booster node cards, so two uh, Xeon Phi processors, uh, 
the uh, booster interface sits on, on top of them uh, within this, this, this chassis. Um, and, uh, well, in order to get to the 384, uh, uh, you, you have to equip this rack from the front and, and from the back. So, so if you turn to the back of the rack, you, you will basically see the same picture. Um, so, uh, yeah, by that, uh, we, uh, in the end, uh, uh, produced one, the largest Xeon Phi system in Europe, uh, so which is, a, uh, which, which is a really unique cluster in the sense that, that, it, that, that it clusters autonomous accelerators um, uh, with, within the system, um, well, leading to a scalable and, and more or less energy efficient um, uh, cluster. Um, we uh, develop further uh, prototypes. So one is a so-called energy efficiency ev evaluator, uh, which is basically the same hardware, but, but just smaller, uh, located in, in Garching at LRZ, um, but equipped with, with more um, sensors in order to, to measure energy efficiency. And then we, we have a uh, quite experimental system in Jülich II, where we uh, try to figure out how immersive cooling works for this kind of approach. Ah, by the way, uh, the, the cooling of these, uh, the booster rack is done by direct water cooling um, developed by, by Eurotech uh, within the project. Uh, so I already talked about the, the fabric. So what we use here is Extol, uh, which is developed uh, by uh, Professor Brüning's group in uh, U University of Heidelberg. Um, and in the meantime, commercialized uh, by the, the Extol GmbH. Um, basically, it provides you with a 3D torus fabric, and it has some nice um, um, communication engines included. So you, you can do uh, RMA, so which is remote memory, etc. So basically, remote DMA. So it, it has a messaging engine, uh, so where you can do really low latency messaging. Uh, and last but not least, uh, they, they have this uh, shared memory functional unit where you can map memory from one system into the address space of the other system. And this is what we basically use in order to enable uh, the Xeon files to be remote bootable, uh, so to, to really integrate them without any host CPU in, in, in some remote system. Okay, so with all of that, as I said, we realize this hardware architecture. Now, of course, the question arises, um, so how to program this type of system? Um, so how to put an application on that? Um, so to, to give you an example, so uh, we, we have within the project one climate simulation from Cypress Institutes, which does not just climate simulation, but which also looks at uh, the, uh, the, the chemistry of uh, of gases in the in the atmosphere, and uh, for for this example, we, we did within the project the analysis and found out that it makes sense to put the basic model on on the cluster side, and to have the ch chemistry on the booster side of the system. Then, of course, you have to exchange data back and forth between the cluster and the booster. So you do do sometimes steps in the base model. Um, at the same time, you look on, at how the chemistry evolves in the atmosphere. And then after some time steps, you have to exchange the data. Uh, so the, the chemistry model needs new input on how the gases are distributed in the atmosphere. On the other hand, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the changes in the, in the chemistry of the atmosphere has to be communicated to the base model. And then you can do further time steps. Right? So, so this is how you want to separate these type of applications. Um, we have not just the climate simulation uh, in the projects, uh, but uh, yeah, in total uh, we, we have uh, uh, 12 applications uh, in, uh, in, in, in both deep and deeper projects, uh, so that they are listed here, uh, which come from a, from a really wide field uh, of, uh, of, of applications. And uh, actually also the, the neuron code uh, done by, by EPFL uh, in, in the context of, of this project uh, uh, is, is included here. So, so also for, for Neuron, we, we started the analysis on how to distribute it uh, over this cluster booster system. Um, of course, so, so when you, once you have done the analysis how to distribute it, uh, you, you have to change your program in, in, in some way. And, and for that, 
you, you really need a programming paradigm for, for these type of heterogeneous systems. And obviously, um, it, it cannot be the same programming paradigm that you have for these uh, standard accelerated clusters that we see today, so where you have a GPU in, in each node. And uh, in fact, the, the software architecture that came out of that uh, looks at the first sight quite complex. Nevertheless, uh, so it's, it's well structured, so it's, it's not too complicated, in fact. So if you just concentrate, say, on, on the left-hand side uh, of, of this uh, sketch here, uh, well, you, you see basically the, the standard uh, software stack. Uh, so you, you have some processes uh, underneath, uh, then there, there is the Intel compiler uh, for Xeon in, in order to create your executable. Um, well, let's forget about the OMS compiler for, the, uh, for, for, for this point of time. Uh, then there you have some low-level InfiniBand communication library. There's an MPI on top of it, and, and then finally the application. If you look at the booster side, uh, you, you see pretty much the same, right? So you, you have the booster node processors, so some C on Phi. There's a compiler for that. There's a low-level communication uh, library for Xtol. There's an MPI sitting on top of that. And then finally, you have uh, the part of your application that runs on the booster side. Um, then, of course, uh, well, we, we, we have some specialities in the system. Uh, well, you, you have to do communication between uh, the, uh, the cluster side and the booster side. Uh, so you, you have to go through these booster node, uh, the, the, through these booster interface nodes. Uh, so there has to be some cluster booster communication, so there's a library for that. And of course, resource management gets a bit more complicated because now you have heterogeneous resources. So we have to work on that. Um, nevertheless, um, well, and, so now, now we, we, we come to the OMS compiler, which is plotted here and here, and, and OMS also comes up here. So what is OMS, or OMPSS? Um, so it's a development of, uh, of BSC, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and it's basically a kind of uh, forerunner for, for OpenMP. So they, they use it in order to, to figure out if new ideas that they have, uh, when, which might be worthwhile to, to, to think about, how to, 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 implement, uh, to, to integrate them into OpenMP in, in order to figure out does it really make sense and, and to, to play around with that. So what, what it basically is, uh, so you, you start with some serial code and then instead of um, yeah, putting in um, OpenMP pragmas, you, uh, you, you, you put in um, uh, uh, OMPSS pragmas and um, and uh, so, so the, the basic idea behind OMPSS is to, to split your, your, your uh, execution model into, uh, into smallish tasks with, with, with which are stateless. And, and then you, you just track the data dependency uh, uh, in between these tasks. And with that, you, you create this uh, directed uh, acyclic graph, so a DAC. And, and then you uh, just work on this DAC uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to really do all the tasks which, which are with in, this, um, uh, in this graph. And, and by that, uh, you, you have an alternative and uh, a more flexible model uh, to um, taskify uh, or, or, or uh, your, your uh, application. And then, of course, you, you might put all these tasks onto single threads. And by this means, you, you have a more efficient way to profit uh, from the, the multiple threads that you have in, in multiple multi or many core processors. Um, okay, so, so that much for form is, is for, for that time. Um, and then on the other hand, well, we, we, we have now an MPI for the cluster side and for the booster side of the system. But still, of course, the question is there, how can you benefit from both sides of, of these systems uh, within your single application? So, and for that, you, you have to find a measure in order to start, uh, well, let, let's assume you, you, you start your main part of the application on a cluster side, and you have to find some measure in order to also start parts of your applications on the booster side. And the model that we follow here is to think really about having an MPI application on the cluster side of the system, and then there is some mechanism in order to start, uh, yeah, say highly scalable code part which fits better to the uh, booster side of the systems um, uh, yeah, to start it there. 
and, uh, and the idea is that this uh, start or spawn uh, uh, of this uh, other part of the application is really a collective operation uh, of the processes running on the cluster side of the system, right? So your application uh, runs on, on multiple cluster nodes with multiple processes, and these processes do a collective operation in order to start uh, a, 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 another part of the application on the booster side. And not on a single booster node, but on, on multiple booster nodes, uh, enabling them to really talk to each other after having started them. So to, to, have, to start a kind of second MPI application on the booster side. Um, so how does it work technically? Well, uh, we found out that um, actually MPI brings all the mechanisms uh, that we require in, in order to, to implement this type of mechanism. And actually, uh, already from, from a quite early version of the MPI standard, so I, I guess this MPI com spawn, this is the call that we use there, uh, was introduced in MPI 1.1, so uh, about 20 years ago or something like that. Um, so what does MPI com spawn actually do? Well, you have to have a communicator uh, uh, set up, so in, in your cluster application. So this might be some uh, newly created communicator or might be the, the global communicator uh, on the cluster side. And then these, uh, the, the processes being part of this communicator do this MPI com spawn call, which is a collective call. And this creates a, a, a second MPI application, uh, in our case on the booster side, uh, which sets up its own global communicator, so the MPI com world. Uh, so with that, we, we have at least the, the MPI mechanism on the, on the booster side. Uh, now, how can both parts talk to each other? Well, in, in MPI, there is a so-called intercommunicator, uh, which enables then uh, to uh, these processes to talk to this group of processes and vice versa. And uh, so how to, do you get the, the uh, intercommunicator? Well, if you call MPI com spawn, so if you are a parent process, you just get it uh, back from MPI com spawn. On the other hand, so uh, first of all, the processes here don't know about their parents, but there is a call, MPI get parent, in order to figure out is there some parent group of processes, and uh, well, get the, the intercommunicator uh, from, from this call. And by this means, uh, you, you, you can enable the processes to talk to each other. Sounds complicated? Well, um, from the programmer's point of view, all you have to think about is there is an MPI on the cluster side, it's specialized for InfiniBand. There's an MPI on the booster side, it's specialized on XTOL. Um, and there is the MPI com spawn in order to, to uh, yeah, start uh, from one side, processes on the other side. In fact, it works also the other way around. And there is some specialized cluster booster protocol uh, which enables uh, to uh, you to, to talk, uh, to, 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 uh, which enables the groups of processes to talk to each other in a very efficient way. Um, so what helped here was the fact that we used this Parastation MPI, uh, which is quite flexible uh, concerning uh, how to, to implement uh, uh, new communication layers. Um, so we, we had to extend this uh, for, for XTOL in order to be able to, to support this on, a, on the booster side. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, in addition to that, we also created a plugin uh, which, uh, uh, which enables uh, the, the, the cluster booster protocol. And, and with that, you, you just see a, a global MPI spanning over the whole heterogeneous system. And uh, yeah, basically hiding all, all the, the, the uh, complications that come out of the heterogeneous system by um, yeah, just, just hiding it behind the MPI. Um, nevertheless, this is still complicated because you have to split your applications and have to put in this MPI com spawn and have to include the, the, the communication be uh, between cluster and booster part and so on. And um, yeah, to, to make things easier, we, we then in the end uh, also in included this OMS offload abstraction layer. So now coming to that, what, what this actually means. Um, well, what what uh, OMS is good for here on, on this level is just to annotate your code on, on how to, to split the, the code between different threads. 
And you can think about, so, so once you, you have this mechanism, it also makes sense to, to put it on, on, on the way more higher level and to, and to split your application into tasks, which are, no, are not lightweight and, and run on single threads, but which are quite heavyweight, which do MPI and, and then run, for example, on the booster side. And this is what we implemented in this OMS abstraction layer. So what you actually have to do, well, you, you still have to do the analysis of which part of your application fits best to the cluster side or the booster side. But once you have done that, you just have to annotate your code and have to tell, well, I expect this part of the code to run on the other side of the system, so say on the booster side. And then the, the OMS compiler uh, uh, yeah, looks at these pragmas and uh, splits up uh, uh, the, the source code in, 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 a, in, in a virtual way to, to put it into the native uh, compiler of the cluster side and the booster side and to, to create the cluster and the booster executable. And then what you as an application developer basically uh, just have to do, of course you have to request for the uh, right amount of resources uh, to the resource manager, but um, well, you, you just have to start say the cluster executable by some um, MPI exec, then it starts on the cluster side, and then magically inside there is this MPI comp spawn, which starts a booster executable on, on the booster side, and, and then they, they talk via MPI uh, to each other. And uh, the, the basic idea is that, uh, well, in, in, in the end, uh, you, you just put some, some annotation into your source code, so which means if you compile the same, very same source code on a standard cluster, it still runs there. Right, so uh, because on the standard cluster, the, uh, this machine is not, or the, the compile chain there is not aware of the, 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 the OMS abstraction layer, so it just ignores the, the corresponding pragmas. <coughs> okay, so what are the, uh, the advantages that come out of DEEP? Well, it's, it's, our claim is that it's really more flexible than, than a standard architecture, so you can actually really define a dynamic ratio of processors and coprocessors or accelerators. Um, so you don't have to do, uh, have to fix this ratio at the time of procuring a, a new system, but you have to fix this ratio at the time when you start your application on the system. So you can use the booster as a pool of accelerators, which is globally shared. But beyond that, uh, you, you can uh, uh, also uh, yeah, you, you see the, the figure, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the picture that, that I just sketched. Um, uh, so you, you, you can you use this kind of um, specialized symmetric mode, right? So you, you, you can start an application on, on one side of the system and having a part of the, of the application on, on the other side. Uh, of course, you can still use uh, the cluster and the booster in a discrete way, right? So if you have an application that scales on a blue gene system, so most probably it does not make sense to really split it between cluster and booster. It makes sense to just run it on the booster side because it, it shall be uh, well prepared for the booster side of the system. Um, so the idea is that in the end, uh, yeah, so since we, we can run all these uh, usage models at the same time, uh, the idea is to really have a more efficient use of, of the global system resources that we have available. Okay. So now you might raise the question, so um, that, that, that there are some parts missing, right? We, we, we haven't really talked about I.O. Um, we, we might want to talk about uh, resiliency and so on. And, and this was the motivation to start with the next project, uh, a project DPR or Deeper, um, yeah, which basically tries to improve uh, the, the deep concept. So the first step that we take, of course, is uh, since um, the, the KNC version of C on Phi, so the, the still current version uh, is yeah, kind of um, end of life, so the, the, the next version of C on Phi is announced to be finally there now by mid of this year. Um, I think the original planning that was that it was there about one and a half year ago. Nevertheless, so hopefully it appears by mid of the year, so it's obvious that it makes sense to, to really update uh, the hardware architecture, so to use and the next generation of CM5, so the, the KNL CM5. Um, they have some benefits, so they now can really run autonomously out of the box. Um, 
so we, we don't have to do these tricks with the booster interface nodes and so on. Um, on the other hand, so we decided that, that Extol is now mature enough to, to really base the whole system on, on Extol. Uh, so Extol was quite experimental when we started with Deep. So the software stack, especially for the cluster side, was not mature enough, so now it's mature enough. So the idea is to, to really have only a unified deeper interconnect. And, and this unified deeper interconnect is Extol. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, we want to update uh, the, the booster nodes so that there will be an, an KNL uh, in included, of course, an Extolnik, and then this uh, NVMe, uh, this uh, non-volatile memory part. So this is a second uh, branch wh where we want to look at uh, within the deeper project how can we benefit uh, from this non-volatile memory technology that, uh, that currently uh, pops up everywhere. Um, of course, uh, there are still uh, cluster nodes, uh, so they are now integrated into the, the Extol fabric, uh, still running some Xeon processor, having an Extol NIC, and uh, yeah, having some um, storage uh, a, a attached to it, at least uh, some of the cluster nodes in order to figure out um, how can we do an efficient I.O. concept on this cluster uh, booster concept on top of the cluster booster concept. Uh, because this, this is one main, uh, main, one main uh, uh, objective of the deeper project. So and then last but not least, there are these, these NUM uh, modules. So what is a NUM, NUM module? NUM stands for Network Attached Memory. So the idea is to really more or less directly attach memory uh, to, the, the, to the fabric, right? So th there is no processor on, on this side. Um, so that there's just a NIC, uh, which is an Extol NIC, and the memory, uh, which is an, an hybrid memory, memory cube memory attached to this NIC. Since uh, this NIC is implemented as an FPGA, uh, at, at least on, on, on these nodes, um, so we, we still have the capability to, to introduce some functionality there, and I, I will come to that later. Um, so then, uh, as I said, uh, so one uh, objective of Deeper uh, is uh, to really explore how to do I.O. And we, we have a really, um, um, yeah, on, on the first side, quite complex approach. And in fact, this is that complex because we want to compare different approaches uh, within this project. So we are based on the, on the file system VGFS. So this was formerly known as, as a Fraunhofer file system developed by Fraunhofer in Germany. Um, and um, then we want to see how, uh, so, and, and this is just a standard global parallel file system like the GPFS from IBM or like the Lustre file system. So th this is just yet another file system of this type. But of course, um, if you look at highly scalable applications and, and you want to do I.O. To, towards such a global parallel file system, um, you, you see usually quite early uh, some scalability issues. Um, and then we want to explore how different approaches um, can uh, improve uh, the, the scalability of the file system from the user, uh, so from the, from the application point of view. So one is to extend the file system itself, so to, to extend the BGFS. So one is to use an approach like Cionlib, which is uh, developed at, uh, uh, at, at Jülich, or to, to use some, some other approach uh, with, within the, the Exascale 10 project. On the other hand, uh, we want to look at, at uh, resiliency. So uh, if, if you scale up your system, of course you have more hardware com components and these more hardware components might fail. So, and and you, you have to handle this in a way. Um, and, and we want to explore uh, different approaches. So one approach I, 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 I want, want to sketch here um, so I al already mentioned that, that we, we, we have this, uh, uh, the, this OMS approach uh, within the deep programming model, so to really taskify our application on a very high level. So the, the, the part which are started on the booster side are actually uh, tasks, which means they are stateless. And we can benefit from that uh, in, in our resiliency approach. So once again, 
We do the startup, so we, we start the highly scalable code parts on the, um, on the uh, booster side of the system, and, and now assume that, that one of these processes might fail. So this, of course, means, um, well, so, so the, the, the cluster part of the program cannot really uh, continue to run, uh, and, and so it, it's, it's quite complicated to, to really um, replace the, the process on the fly. So let's just uh, remove this highly scalable part for the time being, but since it was OMS starting uh, this highly scalable code part, uh, it has all the information required in, in order to, to restart it, right? And uh, well, so this might be done automatically, so at least this is a goal within Deeper, uh, to, to really restart this highly scalable code part via OMS, because OMS has all the information. So which means that now on different resources, because, because this resource has failed, we can continue to run the application. And this is more or less transparent uh, to the application itself. Um, of course, uh, you, you, want, you, you might want to do some, some extra uh, mileage here. So for example, um, if you have a part of your application that runs on the booster side for about an hour, you might not want to lose the whole hour, but to do some checkpoint restart on, on this side too, right? So to have a checkpoint restart library there. And, and then if you restart your application, uh, or the, the, the booster part of your application, uh, this might figure out, well, that there was already a checkpoint, so let's fast forward uh, to, to this checkpoint and uh, to prevent, to, to recompute the, the, the whole thing that was running uh, uh, on, on this side. Um, so for, for this, uh, we introduced uh, also some multi-level checkpointing, right? Um, so since we have non-volatile memory in the, um, in, 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 in all the nodes, it might make sense to, to just store backpoints, uh, um, to, to, to store checkpoints locally, because this is way faster than writing to, to a global file system. And then you can think about different levels, right? So, so having local checkpoints, which of course will not survive if, if you really lose the whole node, uh, be because the checkpoint is not available anymore, to have uh, with, with less frequency, so say every hour or something like that, uh, storing a checkpoint to a global file system, so to really survive some cr catastrophic problems, and to, to have something in between, like a body checkpointing, so creating pairs of processes which mirror that checkpoint, so if you restart the application and you have just lost one of the nodes, uh, well, you, you still have the inf information on the other node, so, so you can restart. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, uh, so I, I think I, I skipped this num part. So this basically explains the, the API that we use in order to access the num. So it's just some malloc and, and free and, and some put and get in, in order to push and pull data uh, uh, to and from the, from the num. There are some more complicated um, APIs which basically have the idea that you can use something like an, an active memory, so to, to move some um, operations to the memory. So but last but not least, um, um, so I have now concentrated on, on, on uh, introducing this, this cluster booster concept, right? Uh, and uh, well, you can think of that in, in a more abstract way of, of having modules, right? So you have the cluster mo module at a, as a kind of central module. So now within uh, deep and deeper, we, we have introduced uh, this, this many core booster, so as one module, uh, we, we have the storage module for, for the file system. Um, within uh, Deeper, we also introduce uh, these, these kind of, uh, let, let's call the, the NUMS memory booster. But of course, you can think about having uh, more modules, right? For, for example, you, you can think about if, if you want to go into the big data direction to uh, add a data analytics module. Or uh, if, if you want to do visualization uh, to, to add a, a, a graphics booster module. And actually, um, you can even think about having uh, more modules, right? For, for example, uh, if, if you have some, uh, for, for some applications, some, some dedicated hardware, for example, some neuromorphic hardware, you can also attach uh, a, a kind of neuromorphic booster uh, to, to this system. Or if at some point of time we have something like a quantum device ready, you, you might uh, also uh, attach something like that. Um, 
In fact, uh, we, we have the plan to, to implement uh, something like that uh, in the context of the Jureka system. So there are quite concrete plans to attach a, a many core booster um, based on KNL uh, during this year or, or early next year to this system. Um, but of course, uh, well, you, you can think of, of, of um, yeah, adding uh, some hardware like that uh, to the system. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you m might want to, want, to, want to add something like, like this D-wave quantum computer to the system or doing even more, more exotic stuff. Uh, of, of course, uh, so, so this is our concrete plan. So these are possibilities, right? So what shall you take away from that, um, for, from this lecture? Um, okay, so I try to convince you that, that Deep and DPR uh, is really ex explored a new way to use and manage heterogeneity. So to have this cluster boost, booster architecture um, and actually implement it in order to be ready for experimentation. Um, so one main outcome from my point of view actually is the programming model. Uh, in fact, the programming model is actually uh, in, in, uh, in now in, in, in place in a way that you can use it also on, on other architectures. And, and if you take a brief look at the next generation of Cray system, which is uh, already announced, well, you, you see something similar that like our cluster booster concept, right? You can buy from, you, you will be able to buy from Cray in say by, in, by, by mid or end of the year systems which have Xeon processors and a KNL generation Xeon Phi processors. Within a single fabric, this looks pretty similar to the deeper system, right? And there will be a global MPI for that, right? So um, all, all, all the uh, pieces are there in order to put together this cluster booster concept also on the next generation Cray system. So we have this uh, deep 384 KNC booster up and running. Well, well mostly we, we still, uh, fight with, with some problems, but uh, well, at least in principle it runs. It's not too stable, but it runs. Um, so the, the projects are application driven. Uh, so uh, yeah, what, what, what we knew before, but, but what we have seen within the project is that that co-design is really important. So we need the, the input from the application developers in order to be able to, to evolve our hardware platforms and also on our, our system software. Um, so we try to hide uh, yeah, as many details as possible behind this OMS abstraction layer. Of course, everybody who wants to can still go to the, well, kind of assembler level and doing the, the MPI stuff on, 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 on their own. Um, so in deeper, we extend this to, to IO resiliency and uh, look into these uh, memory technologies like on, on the pure te uh, technology point, from, from the pure technology point of view, NVMe, so non-volatile uh, memory technology, and, and also explore what we can do with the NUM. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, uh, so that there are quite concrete plans to extend this uh, new Jureka cluster by a uh, booster in, uh, in, in, in 2016 or early next year. So depends on when KNL finally is available and, and how we, we, we can uh, manage this project. Um, so the idea is to, to have something in the, in the range of 10 petaflops. And um, yeah, as I said, we actually think about how to, to include more modules. Um, so a, a, a next round of EU projects uh, uh, will, will, will uh, start sometimes next year. So the, the, uh, uh, the, the well, so, so the, the, the call will, be, will go open, I, I think, sometimes in April and, and close uh, around September, and, and we plan uh, to, to go for next uh, project there. If you need more info on, on DEEP or DPR, so there are these pages, or just uh, ask questions right now or talk to me in, 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 during the coffee break. Thank you.